Thank you very much, everyone. On a time clock, as I say to my distinguished, energetic, amazing Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, welcome to San Fernando West and to the city of San Fernando. <laughs> to the distinguished political stalwarts in this audience, our party officers, my fellow candidates, and to Trinidad and Tobago, welcome to the prism of a discussion that is intended to awaken your spirit and awaken your mind. So let's get to it. I stand before you as the Member of Parliament for San Fernando West, having had an opportunity to work in this constituency of 25 odd thousand people for the last five years. I also stand before you because of the faith of my political leader and Prime Minister as the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And I have come to have a conversation in San Fernando to the nation on the issues that grip us all. San Fernando West, much like the criminal justice system, needed to be analyzed into its elemental pieces. How many people live here? What do we look like? How do we live? Where do we live? In what circumstances and what issues plague us? The two large issues are the economy and crime. And they're very much intertwined in our city and in our nation. And in short order, I tell you that about 25,000 people, 8,500 of us live in HTC communities. And thousands more of us live in squatting communities. And if you take nearly half of your constituency and hold it up to light, we live in those two areas. On the one hand, in our squatting communities, in what I refer to as invisibility. Invisibility is the invisibility of the land you're on, that you cannot take to a bank because you don't own it, that you cannot leave to your children because you don't own it. And in our 11 HTC communities, certainly with no form of care dedicated to them, either our most vulnerable or our HTC communities since Patrick Manning was Prime Minister and until Dr. Rowley became Prime Minister, we had a situation to treat with. And in the redevelopment of San Fernando, I can tell you in very short order, we looked to lift our most vulnerable out of their circumstances. We went into our squatting communities and we developed the Housing Village Improvement Program, demolishing squatting homes where they stood and rebuilding them and replacing them with dignified homes that people can leave to their children with land tenure by the hundreds and into the thousands. That's the first limb. Our HTC communities, all 11 of them, under active development, under active renovation. And more importantly, the connecting dots right now into the lifeblood of San Fernando, if you look at it in its purpose, has been to bring to life the San Fernando waterfront development. And I wish to thank the Honorable Prime Minister as the head of the cabinet, as the minister with responsibility for Udicott, as the minister of planning as he is, for giving San Fernando its fair share. And its fair share looks and feels like reality. Because if you pass at the San Fernando General Hospital, 1,002 car parks, you will see action. If you pass at Lady Hale's on the sea, 
where we are building a $710 million development, first class in the world as Miami's waterfront looks. And if you look to our Plaza San Carlos, our 3.8 hectare development, our fishing port at the wharf, our 241 homes at HTC communities, if you look to our road widening, our boardwalk facility, four lanes, and we have our jetties and our entertainment and our life. If you stop and you go to Skinner Park and you see it under development, if you stop and you go to Irving Park, Sutton Street, and you see our 75,000 square feet of magistrate's court, and if you stop and you go to the family court site at the St. Joseph's Convent Clooney, and if you stop and you go to Carlton Lane under construction, and you go to our 11 HTC communities, and our play parks, and our engine of growth, and our community centers, and 400 homes at the Marabella Bayshore community. Understand what development looks like because you can see it. And procuring that in an economy where you had in your first year, a 96% drop in your oil and gas revenue. In your middle term, the refinancing of your Petrotrin equation, which was a hard equation to balance. And then you get to your final year with the COVID pandemic and the hit to the economy. Understand the brilliance of a political leader and the energy of a member of parliament in ensuring that we have the ability through open public procurement and through project financing and through tender award. And because we have certificates of environmental clearance, planning permission, the ability to deliver in five years what everyone else spoke about and dreamed about. And what does this mean for San Fernando? Jobs to the tune of 15 thousand as you pass through the temporary, the middle, and the permanent. And to the people that matter, that is a life-changing experience. But permit me now to connect through this prism of development in San Fernando, this salvation to its people. Permit me to introduce a term which appeared on the front page of the Newsday on the weekend. You may have seen the expression madmanism coined by one Faris al rawi quite innocently in reference to a particular UNC candidate, Aloy Hunt, saying that he was going to give powers of arrest to the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. And permit me now to tell you why there is someone in this society who I don't want to have a crush from. You see, I'm a respectable man. My mother brought me up well. My family encourages me to be respectful. But Auntie Kamla, I want no crush from you. And why do I want no crush from you? When you tell Trinidad and Tobago that you will be intent in your desire to repeal every law that we have passed as a government, I want to tell you why tonight from the prism of San Fernando. Because every dollar that we save is a dollar that goes to HDC, squatting communities, and San Fernando waterfront replicated in 40 other constituencies. And let me put the dots together this way. You see, I hear the UNC talk about a plan, much like subway plan, plenty for 20. You have no idea what it is. A big banner on the screen saying 50,000 jobs and you don't know where. So let me connect the dots for you. As I stand here before you, as a member of a government led by a powerful prime minister and as its attorney general, thanks to the prime minister's confidence, I can tell you, the criminal justice system is in a state of operation like it has never been before. Whilst the UNC talks to you about a crime plan, the PNM talks to you about an anti-crime plan. And our anti-crime plan, first of all, involved ensuring that the 
place that you have justice, that sensibility and righteousness to be had in a quick trial, delivering acquittal or guilt, so that a victim is not taken 10 and 15 and 20 years through a rape trial to face a person accused over and over again reliving the experience in that place of justice called a courtroom. You need a judge, you need a prosecutor, you need a defense attorney, you need rules of court, you need to have a witness, you need to have the people that move the witnesses through. And in short measure, I will tell you that this government has delivered a rapidity of fix with thousands of jobs created in the judiciary alone. As I can tell you tonight, 1,000 jobs already occupied in our tenure. First place, the courtroom. 100 courtrooms delivered, not including the Princess Town Court, which is ready to be reopened, the Rio Claro, the Separia, the Arima Courts, the San Fernando Courts that are being built right now. Secondly, for judges, taking our judiciary from 36 high court judges to 64, 12 court of appeal judges to 15, raising the age of retirement from 12, some from, seven, from 65 to 70, giving more judicial time, introducing prosecutorial development, and you will see that there are problems in this country right now where the Trinidad and Tobago Police Force police service is engaged in action for the first time taking litigation seriously, all of a sudden with a rapidity, and people want to slow down in the UNC. And people want to talk about political interference, not understanding that this prime minister and this attorney general took away the anti-corruption investigation bureau from the AG's office and gave it back to the police. And so your prosecutors, with a DPP's office opened in Tobago, a DPP's office being built out in San Fernando, a DPP's office ready for handover to the Attorney General on Wednesday of this week, we've massively increased the prosecutorial arm. We've taken that further down the line, and we have moved next into creating a public defender's division, opened, staffed, 30 lawyers, so that if you don't have a lawyer, your lawyer is provided for you. We have taken the magisterial caseload from 146,000 cases a year, and as we open the criminal courts, it will drop to 8,500, a 96% drop in caseload. Why? 8,500 marijuana cases December last year, gone with decriminalization. 104,000 motor vehicle and road traffic cases gone in May 2020. Preliminary inquiries fall when we open the Port of Spain courts and 26,000 more disappear. And what does that mean? When you have only 8,500 cases with rules of court, with prosecutors, and now that you have, thanks to the laws passed, a camera and a computer standing as a courtroom in your office, now that your government has opened 12 courtrooms in the prisons, stopping the movement of thousands of prisoners a year at a cost of $25 million. In three months, we moved not a single prisoner from the prison. We took them to court from the prison. We did 3,700 matters from the prison. You're catching my drift on reform. You're catching my drift on justice, as I tell you, with the judge alone trials that we introduced, that Kamla Passad Bicessa said nobody would ever use. Murder trial, man incarcerated for 12 years, acquitted, no appeal. Murder trial, man incarcerated for 14 years, acquitted, no appeal, but take the best one. Wounding with intent, 18 years on trial, 18 years in remand, the trial was over in 20 minutes, flat, with an acquittal. But let me tell you why Kamla Passad Bicessa and the UNC frayed Dr. Keith Rowley and the PNM 
and me, Faris Al Rawi, in particular. Let me tell you why Auntie Kamla have a crush on me. Let me tell you why she has to call my name at every meeting next to my Prime Minister. Let me tell you why. You see, when you have a pickup side of people, some of whom return, who in previous years in your government, Mrs. Fasad Bissessa, arrived in a parliament in a second hand RAV4, and at the end of your term in government as Prime Minister, left these people in her band with Range Rovers, like dinamins that they bought in a parlor, so many Range Rovers they could buy. Ask yourself where the money comes from. And ask yourself, why the UNC's version of Explain Your Wealth is that I build my house from a pumpkin patch and peas in Tobago? Or I have a pink mansion in a part of Trinidad and Tobago that I can't find a single shred of information on? Or that I may be an ex-minister who is living in a house that nobody seems to own and rent-free? And now connect the dots as follows. We took an aggressive plan to deal with corruption, led by the Honorable Prime Minister. And my job as a corporate commercial litigation attorney with many years in that area of law, understanding banking and financing as I do, understanding what white collar avoidance that can lead to evasion looks like, we said, there are only three places that you can hide the proceeds of crime. Cash, companies, and land. In relation to land, you know that we dealt with a very aggressive piece of laws, package of laws. We did the Tobago land package, as I'll call it, to treat with absolute title guarantee. We digitized millions of deeds. We took a system of geographic information systems. We go live in September with electronic filing and digitization all in gear. But we added in a law to make sure that you cannot hold your deed in a top drawer. And if you have your deed registered in someone else's name under a trust, you must register it. And if you have your deed in a corporate vehicle where you use a company to buy the property and you are not named as the owner of the company because you're hiding under someone else's name, that we find all of those things. And let me tell you, see that young lady sitting here, Solange D'Souza? She has been one of the attorneys at the Attorney General's office that has given her lifeblood to birth the civil asset forfeiture law as I compliment her openly tonight in having worked on that with me. You see, she's a little too modest to tell you this. Apart from her vision for Faisabad, it's the vision and thirst and courage in the law that she also has. But let's get down to the dynamites, Land Rovers like dynamites buying in a parlor. And let's understand the concept of cash. Eight billion hundred dollar notes were in circulation. Our prime minister had the courage to say, and I confess to having nagged him to no end um, about the status, our prime minister allowed this country to witness demonetization. Eight billion dollars outside, 7.5 billion dollars came back. 500 million dollars missing in action. Today the WhatsApp message to the people of Trinidad and Tobago is, the UNC, according to the message, will come with old $100 notes, cotton notes, put it in your hand and say, when we come back in power, we're going to allow you to trade those notes. Now let me ask you something. If you couldn't find a good enough reason to bring in your $100 notes when you had a chance to bring it in, don't fall for stupidity and foolishness and accept the UNC barrel of thief money in the ground that they want to give you in an election campaign because the law will not allow for the re-monetization of money. And as you well know, cash is also in a casino. 
You walk into a casino, you put $2 million down on the table, you buy the chips according to the way that it all works, you get up from the table, somebody stands next to your chips, they own it, they want it, they go and they cash it out. Tell me, Kamala Passat Bicessa, why Trinidad and Tobago is bound under your watch to remain the only country assessed by the IMF to have no regulations in the gaming sector. Tell me, Kamala Passat Bicessa, why you oppose FATCA, Global Forum, and the Financial Action Task Force. And you know what's the phrase that you could use to explain those three packages of international surveillance? Foreign accounts. What you afraid so for? Why are you so mortally afraid of disclosure of foreign accounts? And tell me why you are so mortified about the civil asset forfeiture explain your wealth law, which now ties up all of that. You see, criminality is stopped when you take the profit out of crime. In our construct, as we look at San Fernandian lives, and as people say they are concerned about criminality, imagine having double the judiciary, thousands of jobs, computerize the judiciary, you are now able to attend that court on a computer, you file your evidence online, you have the justice system now with 20-minute trials, you now take inside all of the laws that we pass to deal with anti-gang, criminality, firearms, and then you say, well, okay, where are the witnesses? And witnesses have to be brought forward, but the UNC, one Saddam Hussein in particular, wrote a minority report on the evidence bill where we said, give witnesses anonymity, let the court protect a witness, and Saddam Hussein is the sole man writing together with a fellow named Sean Sobers. He plays nice, he talks nice, he hides above the free. And when the UNC said no to that evidence amendment bill, the chance that witnesses' lives died. And that's where the follow the money came in. Foreign bank accounts, FATCA, income tax amendment bill, which Kamala said no to. Trinidad and Tobago inspection of income tax, mutual assistance from foreign countries that they said no to. Global forum package to allow us to trade with the rest of the world. As we now take it down to the Financial Action Task Force, and I had the pleasure of being the Attorney General to deliver Trinidad and Tobago out of negative gray listing and to elevate our country into the rest of the world. So when I hear the proponent of madmanism, one alloy hunt, putting out an article to tell me what madmanism is and to tell me about statistics and what Trinidad looks like, I tell him, go and look at the Financial Action Task Force website and see what they said about Trinidad and Tobago. And look now at where the fear is in the UNC. The fear is discovery of land ownership, the cash that they want to re-monetize, the thief money, old barrel cash that was buried and that was in corruption. They want to tell people, look, we're going to give you a thousand or five hundred thousand. You, we will change it for you afterwards. But as we look further, if you want to tackle crime, go behind drug money, go behind criminality, go behind corruption by taking the profit out of it. In this transparent society that we have built with electronic transactions, as the Attorney General's office is the first ministry in Trinidad and Tobago to have electronic payments live in the ministry, stopping 15,000 people a week from coming into the Port of Spain office alone because they can do their transactions online. Understand the gripping fear that the UNC has to the work that the PNM has done, and in particular, the work led by its Prime Minister and functional work delivered by the Attorney General. You may not know this. We at the AG's office, we have 
passed amendments and delivered 536 laws, opened divisions of courts, hired thousands of people, gone online, taken the profit out of crime by transparency. When Trinidad and Tobago learns that you have $22.5 billion in suspicious activity, you have to pay attention. But I want to tell you something. I got a report from my attorneys at law in the United States of America by way of an example. You see, when we take away preliminary inquiries, what's a preliminary inquiry? You go to the magistrate's court and you have a trial to see if you should be put on trial. An example of a preliminary inquiry is the Piaco Airport matter. It is going on its 20th year in the magistrate's court to see if they have a trial to face. So my US attorneys wrote to me, and I'm careful about pre-trial publicity, so I'll be very circumspect. And they have confirmed for me as follows. I want to read this line. In the US, we have had US matters going on since 2004. I can tell you that the US matters have resulted in 39.9 million US dollars returned or saved for Trinidad and Tobago. 35 million dollars in the airport maintenance contract. Settlement with Hillman, 2 million US dollars collected. Settlement with Da Costa, 1.25 million collected. Settlement in relation to a Trinidadian defendant, 930 million, 930,000 US collected. Settlement with a US company owned by a Trinidadian, 400,000. Settlement recovered from sanction fund, 290,000. Settlement from a particular other fund, which I won't name, 40,000. In total, 39,910,000 dollars. But here's what my attorneys had to tell me. That's US dollars, folks. The main claim that we have going on in the United States is a claim for damages of 43 million US dollars. 43 million US dollars. In the United States, there's something called a RICO law. It's a racketeering law that allows you to treble the damages. We have an educator in the audience here who I want to recognize, Dr. Fayad Ali, who has taught mathematics to over 45,000 people in San, in San Fernando alone. A man that has walked the streets of San Fernando with me every single day saying it's okay a naps man could walk with a press man. I take that. But Dr. Ali will tell you, if you take $43 million and you multiply it by three, you're going to get $129 million. And here is what our UK, US attorneys had to tell me. And I want to read a small excerpt of it for you. The U.S. attorneys tell me that in their report, they have noticed that this case has been going on since 2004. And here this line. There have also been, forgive me, here we go. We have worked with various attorneys general over the last few years, over the last several decades and years. And we have worked diligently to get the main civil case to trial since the beginning of Attorney General Al-Rawi's tenure. With his support and instruction following a period, hear this, of sporadic instruction by Attorney General Anand Ram Logan. Let me repeat that. Under Al Rawi, they get action following a period of sporadic instruction by Attorney General Anand Ram Logan. Now, I want you to remember what Section 34 was passed to achieve. I want you to remember where that case that went to the Privy Council took us. I want you to understand that there's a civil judgment of 129 million United States dollars awaiting trial, and the judge in the United States has said that this is the longest running matter in his docket because it's going on 16 years. And I want to ask you this, in that kind of dance, 
hearing Mrs. Passard Bicessa, senior counsel, talk to the purple of Trinidad and Tobago and address the nation on her 50,000 jobs that she can't identify, telling you she will destroy the Attorney General's office into the Ministry of Justice, back to the Ministry of Legal Affairs, back to the Attorney General's office, where we saved $3 billion by combining it. She wants to rip it apart, but here's what she says. She wants to repeal all the laws that I have passed as Attorney General. I want you to ask yourselves this. Who stands to gain? Who stands to gain in not being called to explain the pumpkin patch and peace house? Who stands to gain in not explaining the pink mansion with a helipad clearing land next door? Who stands to gain in not completing a trial that is 20 years old in Trinidad and 16 years old in the United States of America? Who stands to gain in the explain your wealth legislation not going to work? Who stands to gain in canceling the exposure of having to explain your foreign bank accounts? Who stands to gain in re-monetizing the $100 bill? Who stands to gain in saying that you do not need to declare the trust that you own land and that you're hiding the real owner from? Who stands to gain in an environment where you are campaigning with $400 in a t-shirt, a promise of a house for every human being in Trinidad and Tobago, and when you analyze the plans, you realize that the only way that Mrs. Passard Bicessa could deal with no taxes is effectively to devalue the currency in Trinidad and Tobago. Who in this room wants that? I want to end, as my time has run, by asking you this. Can you imagine in the toughest environment that this country has faced? Price of oil, $27 a barrel when we came in. Two days overdraft given to us to run the country. Dealing with the Petrotrin refinancing and finding an excellent solution with the trade union as we have come closer to that. Dealing with the COVID pandemic, imagine dealing with this country's future from an oil and gas perspective where Mrs. Passard Bicessa, according to the records in the cabinet as the head of the energy subcommittee, failed to turn up for every meeting for five years. Failed to turn up. That committee is chaired by Dr. Rowley. That committee has resulted in renegotiations to Trinidad and Tobago's advantage in the oil and gas sector. That committee has allowed us to have good and positive ratings. That committee has been amplified by the work in our post-COVID post recovery enterprise. Now imagine for a moment somebody in a bright yellow dress propped up by a group of people that have no experience in running a country, none. Or worse yet, propped up by a cabal that you ain't see yet, coming into your, into your face. People that you don't know, coming to the aid of a prime minister in the form of Mrs. Passard Bicessa, who needs to be propped up. Let me tell you, there can be no greater tragedy to the economy of Trinidad and Tobago than causing that reality to even come to life. We in the people in San Fernando on the ground, Honorable Prime Minister, thank you for developing by way of funding and underwriting the work that I asked you for in our 11 HGC communities. We the people in San Fernando thank you for delivering hundreds of squatters out of squalor and into dignity and into visibility. We, the people of San Fernando, thank you for our San Fernando waterfront in its divisible entities all at work at the same time. We, the people in San Fernando, do not accept a reality that is filled with a lack of truth. We in the PNM say thank you, Honorable Prime Minister, for sitting next to a young 
second generation politician as I stand as a third generation one in the form of Brian Manning. <laughs> Sitting next to Daniel Duque, across from Solange de Souza. And we in the PNM say, two more Sundays, 14 days, run them out. In the sweeping challenge, Brian Manning, we did it today, run them out of any chance of taking Trinidad backwards. There's only one choice in a sober environment, for decency and for deliverance into our time of greatest need. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the People's National Movement. I thank you.